Robbie, what's on your radar today? Well, Brianna, earlier this week, in the midst of the collapse of the Silicon Valley Bank, whose depositors are now being bailed out by the FDIC, members of Congress had a Zoom call with members of that agency, the Treasury, and the Federal Reserve. Now, according to Representative Thomas Massey, a Kentucky Republican, one Democratic senator wondered whether there was a program in place to censor speech on social media that could lead to a run on a bank. Now, the run on the Silicon Valley Bank does indeed appear to have been sparked in part by information shared by a financial writer in his newsletter. After that writer, Bern Hobart, exposed the bank's shady finances, certain large depositors began to withdraw. And since the bank is not required to keep sufficient funds on its books to pay back all the depositors at once, this panic created a situation where de depositors had to rush to get their funds out as quickly as possible before the bank ran out of money. With SVB specifically, this was even more pressing since more than 90% of the bank's depositors did not have FDIC insurance, meaning there was no guarantee of a bailout. But the bailout is happening after all, thanks to the Biden administration. But let's set that matter aside for a moment and return to the concerns that Massey raised. Who is this Democratic senator that thinks information that might start a financial panic should be censored on social media, even if it's true information? Well, as Massey revealed to the independent journalist Michael Schellenberger, the senator in question was Mark Kelly of Arizona. Quote, I believe he couched it in a concern that foreign actors would be doing this, Massey told Schellenberger, but he didn't suggest the censorship should be limited to foreigners or to things that were untrue. The people from the three agencies couldn't answer him and just sort of took a pass on the question. Another crisis and the gut reaction from a Democratic senator, how can we censor speech on social media? Maybe that reaction isn't so surprising, given what went on at the weaponization of the federal government hearing last week, where Michael was joined by independent journalist Matt Taibbi in testifying before Congress about the tremendous pressure coming from the government aimed at censoring speech on social media. Republicans had convened the hearing and summoned Taibbi and Schellenberger, two of the journalists responsible for the Twitter files, to testify. The Democratic members insulted them and showed nothing but contempt for the idea that it was improper for the federal government to sidestep the First Amendment and leverage Twitter to engage in censorship. Now to expand on all this and tell us more about his experience, we're thrilled to be joined by Michael Schellenberger. Welcome back to Rising, Michael. Thanks for having me, Robbie. So it's been a wild uh, week for you. We talked at great length about the hearing. We, we, we watched much of it and uh, were really astonished by, again, not just the kind of disrespectful attitude that the Democratic members took toward you because, you know, whatever, political figures are, are not respected and, and are not respectful in turn. But they also, much more disturbingly, I thought, just fundamentally did not understand what the problem is or why we would be concerned about the FBI, the CDC, the State Department, the White House, other agencies, all these, these State, De State Department funded nonprofits coordinating to limit speech. And they didn't seem to care. What was your takeaway? Well, it was, uh, as you mentioned, it was uh, a, a mixture of some amount of humor and some amount of feeling concerned and even somewhat disturbed or chilled. I mean, I think the better interpretation is that the, the Democrats who were demanding that Matt say who his sources were, that they don't understand how journalism works, you know, a more disturbing conclusion would be that they do understand and, and they don't care. I mean, what we discovered in this, what came out of the Twitter files research was really that this wasn't just about, you know, unfair content moderation, that we certainly found that. It was really about this really intense pressure by various government agencies it sort of starts with FBI, but DHS, and we've also seen the White House demanding the censorship and the deplatforming of particularly disfavored views and people. We've also now seen that there's at least $40 million has gone to kind of spawn a censorship industrial complex in American universities and think tanks. There's definite efforts to redirect funding away from disfavored media outlets towards favored ones. It's, it seems pretty coordinated. I don't know how coordinated it is exactly, but this is unprecedented in the history of the United States for the federal government to be funding activities aimed at both establishing a predicate, um, a basis for censorship, and also funding organizations that are directly advocating censorship. And as you know, and I think it's important to remind ourselves, not, the federal government is not only uh, not allowed by the First Amendment to censor free speech, it's not allowed to subcontract or contract out or have other people do that work for it. So just funding people to demand censorship itself is a violation of the First Amendment. So 
I think we left somewhat concerned. I do think that what we saw, we've also seen that when you really bring these issues into the public eye, uh, most people are very strong supporters of the First Amendment, Democrats and Republicans. And I think it leads for most policymakers to back off when they're confronted on it. Yeah, the political figures at that hearing, and again, frustratingly, mostly the Democrats, although, as you said, this should not really be a partisan issue, and, and also the agencies responsible for so much of the indirect censorship are not, you know, are not really operating in exactly partisan fashion. Um, there, they were, it seems to stem from this misunderstanding about the misinformation, disinformation question. Uh, you know, I, I saw you and, and Taibi questioned about about the you know the hack and release of the Hillary emails, et cetera. You're talking about all these bad things, but that's not the information. The, like the underlying information, as was the case with the with the Hunter Biden laptop. Like it's true information. You could obviously say, well, it was illegal how that happened and, and you know, that was wrong. But for journalists to reflect on that learned information is not. That's not being complicit in misinformation. That's a, it's a very weird category that has arisen that is now being used to, to crush speech. This idea that it's it's Russian originated or it's benefiting Russia. So it's again, so it's it's lies and it's wrong and it's okay to censor it, which just isn't true. Yeah, I mean, I think this is. I, I find myself in this very funny. I'm a little disoriented because I never thought, you know, after you know, doing journalism for 30 years and, you know, being, you know, writing about politics for so long that I would need to defend the First Amendment or remind people what the First Amendment says. The First Amendment is very radical. I mean, it's and it's impressive the more you understand about it. I'm not certainly not a constitutional scholar, but when you really look at what the Supreme Court has ruled over the years, basically all forms of speech are protected except for those that result in imminent violence or imminent incitement. In other words, just basically calling for people to be killed directly in a riot type situation. But otherwise, you know, the First Amendment protects your right to be wrong. It protects your right to lie, to tell stories, to be misleading, because, of course, we can't agree about what's misleading. We can't agree about even what the right facts are in various situations. And, and the, our, our founding fathers understood that. So we have these really broad protections for speech that that I, I really come to appreciate I, that I admit to having taken for granted for most of my life. And so when you get people asking, you know, saying things like, well, really, we should be censoring, you know, this misleading information, this misinformation, you sort of see a, an escalation. I mean, we went from basically saying, well, the federal government should be, you know, censoring ISIS recruitment online. And I think most people kind of go, yeah, that seems right. And then it goes to, well, there's all this Russian disinformation. But then very quickly, this got turned on to, quote unquote, misinformation, which is just disagreeing with information that people are sharing online to what's called malinformation, which is misleading information. And we now have seen pressure campaigns um, directly from the White House, but also by organizations funded by the federal government demanding that accurate information of vaccine side effects be censored out of the concern that it will lead to vaccine hesitancy. That's exactly the kind of stuff that you, we should be worried about. You mentioned the concern around information leading to bank runs. You know, in a society, it, you know, democracy and capitalism both depend on this free flow of information. So freedom of speech is obviously a fundamental moral value that we all hold, but it's also necessary for the proper functioning of a democracy and of a kind of economic system that we have. Yeah, these Democratic electeds, at least in particular, seem to have a really hard time disaggregating the idea of the effect of information, inconvenient information, information that might even have a bad effect that I don't want, and information that is true, uh, that is um, that should be suppressed, which I would argue that, that, is, that is a very, very limited category, as you just described. The First Amendment protects very, very broadly. But they're unable to talk about things that might have been inconvenient politically, let's say the Hillary Clinton email leaks, or even certain kinds of COVID information that might have led people to take some risk-taking behaviors, and information that is it warrants the kind of suppression that we're talking about here. And when we're talking about this, this run on the bank and the um, SVB situation in particular, it's it's very misguided. Because remember, part of what, what was happening here was that all of these tech guys were on these text threads and Slack groups together 
talking about a potential run on the banks internally. This wasn't something that initially was being reported out. So the idea that you're going to basically preserve the ability for private actors to have knowledge of something that has such broad public effect by suppressing the ability of journalists to talk about it while it's still being discussed and the bad economic effects are still happening as a consequence of those people knowing and being able to withdraw their funds is extremely perverse. Yeah, that's right. I, it's helpful for you to unpack it a little bit to explain how crazy that would be. Basically, if you would, if you have any situation where you're disallowing or censoring the flow of financial information, you're actually exacerbating all the problems we worry about in terms of insider trading. Mm -hmm. So the you know transparency is absolutely essential. You know, I'll say to Bree that I think one of the things that just keeps coming up, and we heard it in the hearing, and we we hear it all the time, is people say things like these forms of speech that cause harm. That really resonates with, I think, those of us that certainly came from the left or are compassionate people. Nobody wants to cause harm, and we can imagine ways in which speech can cause harm. But that speech is protected, again, in all situations except for immediate incitement of violence. I mean, we're talking about direct, immediate, present danger to people. That's the only forms of speech. Otherwise, every other form of speech is, is protected. And I think that, the, you know, the problem, of course, is that, you know, it's sort of it's I think what I've come to is that you sort of see how a culture of what sometimes is called safetyism, this kind of overprotective culture, a culture that on some ways grows out of a very positive concern for vulnerable people has now been weaponized and abused and is used as a way to prevent forms of speech that we dislike. And I think just in a culture of narcissism, people just end up over applying these terms and just sort of exaggerating what kinds of speeches cause harm. And so I think we have to push back on that. I do think that reasonable people, when you really unpack what what advocates of censorship are saying, and you really understand that when people are talking about disinformation, misinformation and malinformation, in almost every case, it's a predicate, it's a kind of pretext for demanding censorship. And we should be very alert to it and call it out as soon as we see it. Mm. Mm. Amen. It's so odd to see the, the pro-democracy coalition as the ones who want to limit speech on a vast range of topics, now maybe financial subjects as well. How does that enhance democracy to prevent the, the masses from learning information that the insiders already had, exactly as you explained? Uh, Michael, thank you so much for the work you're doing, uh, for, for braving uh, Congress and uh, for being on our show today. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. More Rising right after this.